Hebrews 12, 1 to 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have endured. You have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, thank you for those that you have gathered together in this place this morning, in this building that we call Devon Park Baptist Church. Father, the name isn't important. What's important that we've gathered in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved us, who gave himself for us, and rose again for our justification, that we might be declared righteous in your sight. Lord, thank you for your kindness to us, your generosity, your faithfulness, your forgiveness. Thank you for your great love manifested to us in your dear Son. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God who dwells within us as believers. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill me this morning and use me to bring forth your truth. I pray you be active in the heart and life of everyone that's gathered together in this place today. Lord, that you bring us to understanding of your truth and to a proper response to this truth. Let it grip our hearts. Let it change our lives. Lord, let it make us holy because that's your goal for us. Father, we thank you that you placed us here in this city. We pray that you'd bless us and grow us and help us to have a greater impact. Lord, to see lost people coming to put their faith in the Lord Jesus. Help us to reach out and touch lives, to encourage and strengthen other believers. Father, we pray this is Missions Month. For those, Lord, that have given of their lives, both in this country and abroad, to carry forth the precious gospel of the Lord Jesus. Fill them today with your spirit. Enable them as they proclaim your truth, as they minister to lives, to have your direction and your leading and know your will. Give them help and strength, we pray, that they might effectively attack the work that you've given to them. Father, may they know your presence today in a powerful way in their lives. Sense, Lord, that you're moving in, in people's lives and Lord, reaching lost people. So we pray for your work to continue today. We pray for our country. We're a country, Father, that largely has turned its back upon you. Lord, wants little to do with the claims of the gospel. Lord, with living lives that are honoring in your sight. We pray, Father, to that end, that you would revive your church. Lord, that we would do the job that we need to do to awaken this country. Lord, and rescue us from the wrath of God. We pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of Sundays ago, before Thanksgiving, we were talking about the first three verses or so of this particular passage, and I don't want to really take the time to revisit that this morning, but 
just to say that, that he writes to us here words, if you will, of encouragement in those first three verses because he's writing to a people that were suffering for their faith. They were facing some persecution, but he knew it was going to get worse before anything got better for these believers. He's trying to strengthen them and encourage them. He's telling them that some of the suffering they face is because there's things that they need to lay aside. There are weights, not necessarily sinful things in their lives, but just things that are not really beneficial to them. They don't help them to serve God. They're not helping them to grow in their knowledge of God. And, and so he's praying that some of these things we get rid of in our lives, the weights. And then there's sinful things that are in our lives. Can anybody say this morning, there's no sinful thing in my life? All right? I can guarantee you there's nobody here can say that. And so he says, you're going to go through difficult times in life, sometimes because of the world out there and sometimes because of God up here, who puts his hand upon us to deal with us to get what? Out of our lives. The sin out of our lives because it hinders us from running the race that God's left us here to run. And so he's telling us basically what it's going to take to run this Christian life. It's going to take some difficulty. It's going to take some days of suffering and pain. Don't be surprised when it comes. Don't be discouraged. Don't throw your hands up in the air and say, I think I'll quit. The encouragement here is run with what? Patience, with endurance, the race that God's assigned to you. Remember we talked about every individual Christian has his race. I don't have to run James's race. He doesn't have to run mine. I know he couldn't keep up to my pace. I'm saying that because he's a marathon runner. But we all have a race, and God wants us to win in that race. And so he gives us some guidance and instruction here and, and tells us there's some things if you're going to run successfully, you have to lay aside. There's some things that you're going to have to endure if you're going to overcome sin. And uh, sometimes... We get the idea in our lives, in our minds, if I become a Christian, it's all about the privileges that I get as a Christian. What we need to understand is along with the privileges, Jesus said, count the cost. That there are some depths to which we'll also need to go in this life. There are some discouragements that we're going to have to face. And this morning, we're going to learn about the fact that maybe the hardest of all, there is some discipline which is another word for chastening, depending on which your Bible uses there. Or, or training is another word that could be used. It's, it's all those are talking about basically the same thing. He says, as an encouragement, if you're going to make it through, get rid of some of the weights. And then he says what, what was referred to in the Scripture there and what we sang about this morning, you've got to get your eyes on who? On Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, who's the author, the beginner, the source of our faith, and the finisher of our faith. If you're going to finish well, you've got to get your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Him. And he, what He's encouraging us is here is look at Jesus, who bore the brunt of sinners against Him, even to the point of what? The shedding of blood. And He says, you, you can't say that you've, who here's endured such suffering to the point of blood for the cross of Christ. Right? We, we haven't. There are people in other parts of the world that have, but we can't say that. And certainly, <laughs> you can't answer, yes, I have, when you say, sin unto what? Unto death. You haven't borne the brunt of sinners to the point where it's killed you, cat. So he says, you're still in the race. Keep on running even though you feel like you're dying. Isn't that what Paul said? You know, all these things have come against me. They're all against me. And the weight of the church is on top of that. And I've been in the sea. I've been in prison. I've been in this. But he, what is he still doing? He's running his race. And that's all held out to us here. Fix your eyes on Jesus who ran his race to the what? To the completion that God had set for him to die on that cross, to be buried, and then, yes, gloriously raised to life through the power of God. So he says, keep that in front of you. He says, take in this 
this exhortation, if you will, this encouragement from God, what the word exhortation generally means, about killing sin. That's part of what he's talking about here, that these things we endure because it's all part of putting to death sin in my life. And I won't do that if everything's smooth, if everything's glorious, if it only sunshines and there's never rain, there's never a storm, there's never any difficulty. I'm not going to become what God wants me to become. How many of you want to become what God wants you to become? Then understand this, that will mean some privileges, but also some depths, and also some what? Some discipline from the hand of God into your life. And He wants us, by the way, to kill sin. Have you ever thought about that? I won't spend a lot of time on this this morning, but I just want to tell you that you ought to be thinking about killing sin. Not in somebody else. <laughs> you got enough in your own life that it'll keep you busy from now until you enter into eternity, right? So you deal with your own. Kill sin within you. Get rid of the sin. If you got this sin that you've been sort of nursing and petting, oh, nice little sin, <laughs> you know, I just have this one, and God will understand. And no, he says, do what? Take it and kill it. Get it out of your life. Get rid of it. See it as something that needs to be put to death, not as something to be loved. And I'll guarantee you, in everybody's life, there is at least a particular sin that you wrestle with, that you struggle with. It may be a number of things, but there will be absolutely one thing. And he tells us here, he says, have you forgotten the exhortation? Well, what was the exhortation? Anybody tell me? Oh, you've forgotten. <laughs> you've forgotten the exhortation, he says. My son... The exhortation which speaks to you as sons, he says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. The exhortation is don't, don't despise it. Don't, literally what it means is don't take it too lightly. When God brings his chastening hand, don't kind of ignore it and keep on going. He's going to uh, talk here like as Esau did, right? And we'll, we'll talk if we have time this morning a little bit about that. He's going to tell us that one of the great things that this does is it identifies who you are. If you experience chastening, it's because God deals with you as his son. Now, don't get all sexist about this. When I say son, I mean sons and daughters, okay? Is that fair enough? But he says, I'm going to deal with you as with sons. Now, I came across something that sort of drove home what I'm trying to say here to me. How many of you know who John Newton is? You ever sang Amazing Grace? All right, he wrote it. And he wrote a poem that was entitled, These Inward Trials. And in it, he's recounting his prayer to God, asking God to sanctify him and set him apart as holy. Is that a good prayer to pray? Okay, now, he's going to tell us what happened in this poem after he prayed this prayer. And he says, I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith, in love, in every grace. That's a great Christian prayer, isn't it? To grow in faith, in love, and in every grace. That I might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. That's a great prayer for sanctification in his life, to God to set me apart as holy, that you might know the fullness of God, that you might see his face. It's sort of the language of, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. I want you to be my heartbeat, Lord. I want you to be the one that I treasure. That's what he's saying here. And then this is what Newton tells us that he was expecting when he prayed, O Lord, make me holy, okay? I hoped that in some favorite hour, at once, he'd answered my request. What's he asking for? Instant sanctification. <laughs> all right? Lord, just hit me with it. And I'll have all this love and all this stuff going on in my life. I'm going to be this wonderful Christian. Just, just give it to me. I had hoped that in some favorite hour, at once, 
he'd answer my request. I want to grow by leaps and bounds. Do you? I'd love for that to happen. That just, but can I tell you, after being a Christian for 49 years, it don't happen that way. It doesn't happen instantaneously that God just, oh, one day you wake up and there you got it. You're not walking down the street, you've been praying for it, and here it's arrived. He says, and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. You want God to subdue your sins? Give you rest? Yeah, good prayer. He wanted to see sin killed and defeated in his life. He wanted rest from that constant battle with sin. Anybody want that? Yeah, I want that. Just an end to it. But he goes on in the poem and says this, please listen carefully. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yes, more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe. He crossed all the fair designs that I had schemed, blasted my gourds and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Will you pursue your worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free and break your schemes of earthly joy that you may seek your all in me. What's he saying? That's how God works. <laughs> he doesn't come instantaneously, but it comes from God revealing your inward self, which is painful in itself, and revealing a sin over here and a sin over here, and you deal with this one, and then there's another one, and then you discover there's another one you didn't even know that you were doing, and, and he's going to do that sometimes through the blasting, sometimes through the depths, and through his chastening hand upon our life. Discipline seems hard, doesn't it? Sometimes we're like the little girl. Father asked her, what's your favorite movie? She said, Beauty and the Beast. So he sat down with her one day to watch it. And as they started to watch it, you know, there were parts where Belle is it and the Beast, she's dancing and, you know, the teacups dance and all that kind of stuff. And, oh, Daddy, I love this, I love this. And, but then there's some bad parts to it, you know, <laughs> She said, Daddy, fast forward that. I don't like that. That's the way we are with the things of God. We like the good parts where there's dancing and happiness and joy. We don't like the part where the preacher gets up and says, you know what? You're going to experience in this life the disciplining hand of God. I have been over the years to a number of church growth conferences I have never been to one yet where it says, Preacher, if you want to grow a great church, preach on Hebrews chapter 12. Have you, Bob? <laughs> it's not recommended. Matter of fact, I know this. You probably can't grow a great church, a large church, by preaching on Hebrews chapter 12. But I want you to know this morning that God says that every word is His word to us, isn't it? And we need it all. It may not be something that we feel is pleasant or we want to hear this morning, but we need to talk about the chastening of God that can take place in our lives. And so I'm going to preach on it this morning. And this isn't easy because I live through this too. <laughs> I face this too. And sometimes I found out that it takes weeks in some cases, and sometimes it's months, and sometimes it's years. And you go under all of this. One of the hardest things, I heard it put this way years and years ago, is to come to a place in faith. This was a woman that said this, where I learned to kiss the hand that smites me. Who smites us here? Who's the discipliner? 
Who's the disciplinarian? Who is it? It's God. And faith needs to come to the place, and Hebrews has been about faith, right? Hebrews chapter 11 was all about faith. Needs to get to the place where it can say, God, if this is what is needed in my life, I don't like it. I'm not necessarily inviting it into my life, but Lord, if that's what it takes, I'll trust you with your disciplining hand to come upon me. And it will be difficult at times. Learn to kiss the hand of our striking Lord. We're not like that. We don't even want to do that with our own kids, do we? We don't want to discipline them. How many of you struggle? Come on. How many of you struggle with disciplining your children? When they got to that place where you just know they really need to go over your knee, and somebody said you, you, you need to apply the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. I experienced that a few times growing up. Some of us are like a, a boy that went off to university. Parents were proud of him. They weren't wealthy. The bills came in every month. They struggled to pay them off. And then mother received a letter from her son. Dear mom, I'm writing to inform you that I have flunked all of my courses. I had an accident and totally wrecked your car. I owe the clothing store in town $2,000, and I have been suspended for the next semester because of misconduct. I'm coming home. Prepare dad. Mother wrote a one-line letter back to him. Dear son, dad is prepared. Prepare yourself. <laughs> I want to tell you this morning, God is prepared. And he's pre prepared to bring the necessary discipline into your life that you need if you ignore the Word of God, if you ignore the Spirit of God as He speaks in you, if you ignore the word when it's preached and taught to you, then you will experience the chastening hand of God if you're his child. God is prepared to deal with his children. I almost entitled this this morning, <laughs> When God Takes You to the Woodshed. Now, most people wouldn't know what a woodshed was anymore. <laughs> but I know what it was because it was right behind our house, and, and, and I made a few trips out there. You know, and I was held like this, and I was whacked like this. And no, I wasn't abused, not by my father, not ever. But he cared about me, and he loved me. I remember a time I was out on the, on the, on the highway in front of our house. They go by there about 100 miles an hour all the time. And I cut right across in front of a car. I don't know how I wasn't killed. Honestly, I don't. I looked, I saw the headlights like they were right there. And, and somehow God spared my life. <clears throat> it's the only explanation I have for it. And my dad saw that, and he took me to the woodshed. <laughs> he gave me a little talking to, <clears throat> and I thought, okay, I'm off. But I wasn't. Then he applied the Board of Education to the seat of my knowledge. I never forgot it. I increased in knowledge that day. I may be here because of it, because he loved me enough to bring discipline into my life. God is prepared to discipline us. Now, there's three ways I want to just say quickly with you this morning that God could deal with our sin. The first thing God can do with our sin is He could just condemn us all. What would that mean? If God just said, you're condemned, that's it. You've sinned, condemned. What's, What's going to happen? You're dead, and then you're where? You're in hell. He could just condemn us all. God could do that. Oh, but wait, he can't. He can't condemn us. You know why? If you're a child of God, Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in what? In Christ Jesus. There's, there isn't. So he can't condemn me. Well, what else could God do? I know he could condone me, right? 
It's, it's okay, Terry. I don't care what you do. It's all right. If it makes you happy, go ahead and try this and try that, and, and, and it's all right. Just ignore sin. Can God do that? No. Why can't he? Because he's just too holy. And the Bible says he's just. And if he just ignored your sin, never did anything about it, what would happen? God would cease to be holy and just, and he would no longer be God. And that's not going to happen. Well, he could condemn us, he could condone us, or he can do a third thing, and that is he can correct us. He can correct us. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, how God corrects us and what he does to do that. When you don't deal with your sins, when you refuse to deal with them, God will deal with your sin by bringing his chastening hand into your life. Now, when we think about these things here, if God just condemned us, people would scream, legalism, legalism, right? When we condemn somebody of sin, people say, oh, that pastor, he's just a legalist. But if God just ignores sin, that would be what? That's liberalism. That's what's loved by a major portion of the church of Jesus Christ today. Just go do what you want. It's okay. God's okay with that. It's no big deal. <laughs> but God doesn't do that either. But what he does do is he chooses to correct us. Listen, not the way of legalism, not the way of liberalism, but the way of love. Right? He deals with us as sons whom he loves. That's what our passage is teaching us here. I want to talk to you for a moment about the motives that God has in mind for chastisement. Why does he do that? He says in verse 5 here, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord what? Loves. The way of love, right? Right? He chastens and scourges every what? Every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Matter of fact, he goes on to say here, if you aren't receiving the chastening hand of God upon your life and there's sin in your life, there's only one explanation for that. You're not his son. You're not his daughter. And if you're one of those that smiles and, well, it's okay, I sin, I get away with it, nothing ever happens to me, wipe the smile off your face. Because it just means this, you're not a child of God, and God will not deal with you as a son, he'll deal with you as a sinner. We'll talk about that if we have time a little bit later. So why does God bring chastening into our lives? It, it is his way of confirming our identity as his sons. It confirms our sonship. It tells me, <laughs> you know, I don't like this, but I'm glad that he's choosing to discipline me. It shows me he loves me. God disciplines his sons. If you were having a party over at your house, and there's a bunch of kids there, and they start to act up, and they're disobedient and so on. If they're your kids, what can you do? You can correct them. You can't do that with other people's kids. Listen, God corrects his sons. He doesn't do that with those that are not his sons. I won't get into all that right now. Hopefully, I'll have a little time later to explain what I mean by that. But if you're experiencing the chastening hand of God, the correcting hand of God, who's trying to train you in the way of righteousness, at least take this hope. At least it means what? I'm his child. He loves me. And he's doing it for my good because without it, the old King James put it very, very, very roughly. It said, ye are bastards. You are illegitimate sons. You're not born again. You're not God's children. And so he's warning us here about this, to look into our hearts. And by the way, let me just say a word here, some of you parents. 
Do you ever hear a father say, son, as he's going to discipline his son, son, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Joanna, <laughs> who heard me say, this is going to hurt me more? And she didn't know the tears I'd shed over that. And walk up to her room. I'd send her to her room so she could think about it a little bit. I haven't got time to go there this morning. <laughs> And then, yes, I would spank her. When it got to a certain point, that's the only thing that worked, just so you know that. I did it because I what? I loved her. You parents that say, I don't discipline my children, The real reason you don't discipline is not because you're worried about hurting your kids. You're worried about hurting yourself. You want to be your kid's best friend. And your responsibility is not to be your kid's best friend. You're to give them training and discipline in their lives. The reason you don't discipline your children is not because you love them too much. You don't love them enough. You love yourself too much. Because you're not better than God. And God says, if you're my child and you're acting up, what's what's he going to do? Oh, I love you too much to do anything to you. No, (laughs) no, 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 no. We sometimes would wish that's the way it was. But God says, I'm going to bring discipline into your life in one form or another. It's going to come into your life. Children that, or parents rather, that don't discipline their children. Sorry, kids, if you're a child here today, Sorry. But your parents are being nothing but selfish if they're not bringing discipline into your life. And a child that's been undisciplined in life is headed for a lot of heartache down the road. A lot of heartache down the road. Learn to properly discipline your children. And I'm not here to teach child training to you this morning, but but, uh, maybe we should do that at some point. Let's go back to the party. You got some kids that are acting up. You don't know what to do with them because Johnny's just poked some little girl in the eye and he stuck his finger in the cake and he started opening the birthday girl's presents and he won't listen to anything. What do you do? Well, let's say I'm having a party for some kids and Isabel's grown up to the point where that's what she's doing to the other kids, bullying them. You know what I do? I call Joanna and say, come get your kid. Take her home. Take her home. Now listen, this is serious. Does God ever do that? According to His Word, He does. Some people will go home because they refuse to allow God to deal with the sin that's going on in their lives. If you're saying this morning, well, I'm a Christian and God never whips me, then read this passage and you classify yourself. Are you a son or daughter of God or are you an illegitimate son or daughter who only thinks that they're saved? But it's obvious by the way that a lot of people live, they're not really Christians. That's what I read in my Bible. The church is filled with single Christians today that are sleeping around. And it's filled with married Christians that are running around. And if you can do that and not pay some corrective discipline in your life for it, you're not God's child. There is a pain that comes. If you can wallow, somebody has said, in sin like a pig in slop, If you can just smile and say, well, I'm just backslidden, you know. You're not experiencing the chastisement of of every reason to ask, am I God's child? Do I know Christ as my Savior? I had to check my watch here. I got to get it out because they took the one off the back and I can't see any of the other ones. The thing I do like is that They're all different times. You realize now that we've confiscated all the clocks in the church, the next step is we're going to meet you at the door and you have to put them all in the basket and you can get them out when you go out.
What's God's motive in chastening us? Well, one is to confirm our sonship. We're his children. Second thing that chastening does is that it compels. <laughs> it sort of shoves us along the way towards what? Towards sanctification. God's encouraging us to deal with sin and things in our lives, to correct the iniquity that we're allowing to take place. And understand again that discipline is not a sign that God doesn't love you. It's a sign that He does love you. And He cares about your life. And He wants you to enjoy a walk of holiness. I heard about a family that uh, there was a father and his three sons. They'd been active in the church. And then they got upset with something. And they just quit coming. The preacher went and talked to them. But they wouldn't listen to him. A sign in the world. And then one day, one of the boys was out in the pasture. And he got bit. By a rattlesnake. His name was John. They called the doctor and they said, there's not anything we can do but pray. And so he called the preacher up and said, would you pray for John? Would you come over and pray for John? He got bit by a rattlesnake. Here's what the preacher prayed. O wise and righteous Father, we thank thee that in the wisdom thou hast, that in thy wisdom thou hast sent this rattlesnake to bite John in order to bring him to a census. He has not been inside the church house for years. And it is doubtful that in all of this time he's ever felt the need of prayer. Now we trust that this will be a valuable lesson to him and that it will lead him to genuine repentance. So now, O Father, wilt thou send another snake to bite Sam and another one to bite Jim and a big one to bite the old man? We've been doing everything we know for years to restore them, but to no avail. It seems that all of our combined efforts could not do what this one snake is done. Thus we conclude that the only thing left that will do this family any good is more rattlesnakes. So, Lord, send us bigger and better rattlesnakes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not funny, is it? Because sometimes God has to send the bigger and better rattlesnakes along the way to confront us in our sin. This is kind of, I think, what happened to Jonah. <laughs> when he was running from the will of God, God prepared a great fish, and they tossed him overboard, and down in the belly of the whale, what? In the chastening of God. I'll tell you this. When he got coughed up on the seashore, he was hit the ground running in the right direction. And some of you need to get swallowed by some whales. So you'll hit the ground running in the right direction with God and serve God and give Him your life and lift up God in every way that you can. He brings discipline into our lives to compel us towards sanctification, to, to cleanse us from sin. Now, I know what you're going to say. The only thing that can cleanse us from sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. But I'm talking here on a practical level, right? When the chastisement comes, he moves us down the road towards the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And that's what God wants to see in your life. He wants to see righteousness in you. He wants to see you living in a way that pleases God. And so he will come and he will work. And I, I want to talk to you about how does God bring this chastening into my life? Well, he says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. The first way that God begins to chasten us if we're headed in the wrong direction is he speaks to us. It might be through a preacher. You're sitting there saying, who told him what I was doing? And it's really what? It's God speaking. Or you've opened up your Bible and you're reading, and it deals with the very thing that's going on in your life, and God says, no, 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 no. And there's that, that little voice, isn't there? And you know. Matter of fact, most of the time, we know instantly when we've done something or said something that we shouldn't. How many of you know instantly? <laughs> shouldn't have done it. Wish I hadn't done it. That's God speaking to your heart, but if you ignore that voice, right? You don't listen to God as He speaks to you. One of the, the things, Joanne, I hope doesn't mind me saying this, but some kids are mulish when it comes to trying to talk to them about their sin. 
right? They don't really want to listen well. On the other hand, one of the things with, with Jeff was that we just hardly ever had to spank Jeff. There were times we spanked him. But you just speak to him. And the tears would just burst and start running down his cheeks because he was sensitive. Now, I want to just warn you, don't be mulish when God speaks. Learn to develop a tender heart to the voice of God. You'll save yourself a multitude of pain in your life if you just be sensitive to God's voice. It'd be great, wouldn't it, (laughs) if all that was ever necessary was that internal voice of conviction that comes from the Spirit of God and the Word of God. To say, no, 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 you don't want to do that. You don't want to develop this habit. You don't want to go down that road in your life. Then he moves on to the next thing that God does. Not only is there an internal conviction, we get rebuked by God in our spirit. But secondly, there's an external affliction that may come into our lives. And I wrote beside that in my notes the word restrictions. When Joanna or Jeff wouldn't do what we asked them to do, and they persisted in doing it, then we tried this. We, we just said, okay, <laughs> you're going to lose some of your privileges. It almost killed Joanna. We said, you can't make any calls this week. We took her ghetto blaster away from her and said, you can't have your music this week. I'm sure she found it someplace else, but she wasn't getting it in our house if we could help it, right? What were we trying to do? We were placing restrictions on her to help her feel there are consequences when you disobey and ignore God. And so we, we try to encourage them along the way. And I want to say to you, you've heard me talk about I spanked our kids, which we did. That wasn't the first thing we did. The first thing was we what? We rebuked them. We spoke to them. We tried to explain to them why they shouldn't be doing this. And when they wouldn't listen to that, then we went the route of restrictions in their life. We (laughs) took some things away. For the next two weeks, you're not going to go to any parties. (laughs) You're going to miss out on this. You're going to miss out on that. We, We put restrictions. It was necessary discipline that we were trying to establish in their lives. And I want you to know there are all kinds of ways that God can do that in your life. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? He'll not hear me. What's that mean? He doesn't answer my prayers. My prayer life just dies. And if that's where you are today, you need to ask yourself, is that the chastening hand of God in my life? Is that why I'm not having any answers from God? Sometimes he doesn't just remove answers for our prayers, he removes his presence. It's not that he's gone away, it's just that you don't have the knowledge or the sense of the presence of God in your life any longer. And I can't imagine anything being worse than having that. David, when he had fallen into sin, comes to God in Psalm 51, and he cries out to God in that great psalm, and he says, Lord, cast me not away from your presence. Why? Because that's what he felt like at that moment, that he'd literally been cast from the presence of God. One of the other things he'll do is he'll reduce his power in our lives so we don't have the power to do what we formerly did. I could stand and preach and nobody's heart ever gets touched or changed. I can put all kinds of passion into it and all my mind into it, but it's not going to be blessed by God. He'll withdraw his blessings. He what? He puts restrictions upon our lives. And I'll guarantee you there's some people that would be here this morning that would be in that category, right? That that you've gotten beyond not listening to the rebukes of God. He's tried that, and he's had to bring restrictions into your life. He just takes away some of your privileges. Sometimes he does it by putting us in a hospital bed on our back through sickness and disease. Sometimes we lose a job. Sometimes we have trouble in our business or, or discord in our families. You remember David, when, when he was sinning against God, discord came into his family as a disciplining hand of God upon his life. That can happen to us, all of these things. And what some of you people would call bad luck. 
may just be good discipline. Let me say it again. What some of you call bad luck may just be good discipline as God's bringing his chastening, chastening hand upon your life. And it wasn't bad luck at all. It was God trying to straighten you out, God trying to get your attention, God trying to change your life. It's part of the disciplining hand of God upon you. We're talking here about God disciplining His children. I don't even want to go here, but there's a third step. We don't listen to the rebuke, and we don't get it when it begins to restrict us in our lives. Then the only other thing he can do is to apply the rod. And he says he what? He scourges. I was a whip where they would beat a person nigh unto death with it. Now, I'm never recommending you do that with your kids. And that should only ever be a last alternative. Do you understand that? And when you do it, you need to be in a calm place where you really love your kids. And you're only going to do it because you don't want to hurt them. You just want them to know what? You can't continue to do this. It's going to be detrimental to your health, to your life, and, and you care about your kids enough to discipline properly before the Lord. That doesn't mean slapping them across the face. I tell people God's given them a padded little area back here <laughs> where a little tap, right? And just doing it, you don't have to hurt a whole lot, but just doing it tells that child, Somebody's trying to build some boundaries on my life, and they need boundaries. Kids feel safe when there are boundaries in their life. They know there's some areas where they can't go to, and somebody cares about them enough to try and establish those boundaries. Do that. And the good news is we've got a God that's going to do it, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not. He'll go there on your behalf because he's treating us as what? As sons. Now, let me just say this. I'd rather be treated by the chastening hand of God as a son than I will be treated as a sinner because God treats sinners not with a loving hand of chastening, but with the wrath of God. And you read Romans chapter 1, and you'll begin to understand about the wrath of God. And listen carefully. God comes to his son and he disciplines him. Do you know what he does with the unsaved and the lost? It says, because when you knew God, you didn't recognize him and honor as God, so listen carefully, I gave you over to the natural outcome of your sin which is to go deeper and deeper and deeper. He gave them over to this and over to this and over to this, and the last stage is what? To a reprobate mind, a mind that doesn't know good or evil. I want you to understand this. Where are we at in Canada? How many of you think we live in a country that understands the difference between right and wrong anymore and good and evil? When we can't on a daily basis in our hospitals take fetuses out of the mother and kill a baby. I want to tell you, we're a long ways down the road to experiencing the wrath of God in this country. And unless the church of Jesus Christ awakens and we get a revival all across this country, we are going to feel more and more the wrath of God where he what? Where he does nothing. Isn't that what he said? He gave them over. He just did nothing. He gave them over and over to what their sin would bring in their life. And sin, when it's conceived, brings forth, what is it? Death. And it will be the death of our nation. But let me say this, in your own personal individual life, if God comes and he speaks and he speaks and he speaks to you and challenges you to embrace his son as your personal savior and you don't do that, you leave yourself out here in a condition to experience what? The wrath of God. Where he'll just say, okay, go it on your own. The Bible says the Spirit of God will not always, what? Strive with man. He'd just give us over. He'd just give us over. And we're being given over in this country. 
And our churches are being given over because they've moved away from the Word of God. And I'm begging you today to understand that (laughs) you ought to be thankful if God's still speaking to you. And God's still dealing with you where you are in your life because it shows that He loves you and He cares about you. (laughs) Do you know what God's interested in? Look what He says in verse, I think it's verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and what? And live. So what's the choice? We be in subjection, we submit ourselves to the Spirit of God, and we live, or we don't submit ourselves to the Spirit of God, and what do we do? We die. And we're dying in this country. And some of you are dying in your spiritual life. Because you're not allowing God to work in your life. (laughs) Dr. Homer Lindsay, a former pastor of First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, once said, some church members must be lost because if they were saved, God would kill them the way they're living. (laughs) He'd have to just kill them because of the way they're living. You know, the Bible teaches that, don't you? You remember the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that was living in disobedience against God and And Paul wrote to them and said, listen, deliver such a one to Satan for the what? The destruction of his flesh. If I destroy your flesh, what do you do? You die. It says that he might be what? Basically, that he might be saved. So here he is. He's a Christian, but he's going down the pathway of sin and disobedience to God. And God gets to the place where he says, look... (laughs) You're poking girls in the eye, you're sticking your finger in the cake, you're opening other people's presents, come on home. And I wonder how many Christians have prematurely been removed from the party because they wouldn't be be obedient to God, wouldn't follow His Word, wouldn't listen to the voice of the Spirit of God and the Word of God as God begs them to follow Him. God wants you to have life, not death. That's what I want you to remember. Well, how do we respond to these things? How do you respond to the chastening hand of God? And it's not easy because it's painful when the chastening hand of God's in your life. I'm sure there were times where I spanked Joanne and she, I walked out of her room and she said, I hate him! I remember one time where she had a boyfriend. I've told you about this. And I caught him, and I threw him out the front door. Told him he wasn't to come back. I just quit too soon. (laughs) Sorry, Sean. (laughs) And she said to me, Daddy, I hate you. I hate you. Do you love me today? Yeah. Because I cared about her enough to what? Exercise some discipline in her life. You've got a God in heaven that cares about you enough. He's going to exercise some discipline in your life because He cares about you. Now, when the discipline comes, you can react in a lot of different ways. You can resent the discipline of God. You can get bitter and angry that God's allowing this to happen in your life. Just resent it with every fiber of your being. He says, nor be discouraged. Don't faint, he says, when, when you are rebuked by Him, you just want to give up and quit this Christian life. That's what some do. They just reject the disciplining hand of God. If that's the way it's going to be, I'm, just, I'm not going to church. I'm done with this God thing. I'm not going to serve Him anymore. And some have done that. You can, you can resent it. You can absolutely reject what God's doing in your life. Or thirdly, for time's sake, (laughs) you can receive it. Did you know that? You receive it from a loving hand and come to the place where I'm willing to kiss the hand that disciplines me and spanks me because I know he has only my best interests at heart. 
And He wants to help me get to that place where I can experience in my life the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I can be sanctified and holy before God. And I said a couple of weeks ago or last week, God's not so interested in whether you're healthy. He's not so overly interested in whether you're wealthy. He's not overly interested in whether you're happy. He is supremely interested in that you're holy. That you're holy. That you're holy. God's not even supremely interested that you get to heaven someday. I'm going to heaven someday, but that's just a byproduct. What do I got to be in order to get to heaven? I've got to be holy. And God is going to put us through this process. It includes the chastening hand of God to make us what? Holy. Cooperate with God. Work alongside of Him. Let Him bring this training and discipline into your life so that I promised myself I wouldn't go over time, so I'm going to have to stop. But let me, we'll, we'll come back to this. But he talks about the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You know one of the things that's there? Peaceable. When you walk in righteousness, there's a greater degree of what? Peace that's in your life. Peace with God and the peace of God. How many of you want peace? You know, we hear these people every year in the new year, oh, we're praying for world peace. The only way you can have peace is to be right with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Then it says the fruit. How many of you want to be productive in your life? Right? I want to go through my life and waste it and look it back and filled with regret and accomplish nothing through it. I want there to be fruit. That will only come when I receive, by faith, the chastening hand of God in my life. The peaceable fruit of what? Righteousness. The righteousness of God. What's that mean? Well, for the sake of another P, purity. (laughs) Peace, productivity, and purity in my life. You want to be pure? Be careful. You remember John John Newton prayed that prayer? (laughs) And what God did to him? Let's just be open this morning. How many of you would say, God, I want to pray that prayer? Because I know what you have in mind for me is more important than what I have in mind for me. Trust Him. Trust Him. Bring yourself into subjection to Him. Yield yourself to the power of God that's only interested in perfecting you in the image of His dear Son. To be like Jesus. God speaking to you this morning? Some of you maybe. Pastor, I think I've been experiencing the chastening hand of God in my life. Congratulations. If you've recognized it. What's the next step? You're going to resent it? You're going to reject it? Or you're going to receive it? Some of you this morning need to make a decision before you go out that door what you're going to do with the chastening hand of God upon your life. Because if you're his child, you're going to experience it. It's going to come. Because if we're not perfect, and we're not, God will have to keep chastening us. Won't he? Isn't that a great way to build a church? (laughs) And if you're here this morning... You've grown up in a home, and maybe your parents said, well, you made this decision at this time, but listen, it really doesn't mean anything to you. And you know you're doing some horrific things in your life that you shouldn't be doing. And you're not experiencing any chastening hand of God at all that you can tell in your life. That This message this morning might be a wake-up call to you to say to you this morning, you need to what? You need to get saved. You need to come to Christ and have your sins forgiven. Listen, I know this, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you will increasingly face the wrath of God against sinners, which means what? Increasingly, you'll move away. And you won't hear the voice 
becomes a whisper and you don't hear it at all and you just go on and you sin and you sin and you sin and you don't care and it doesn't bother you and you're happy in your sin but listen one day you won't be happy in hell and I'm begging you this morning in the name of Jesus who died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin come to Jesus give him your heart give him your sin receive his righteousness receive his gift of eternal life yes a home in heaven someday but yes receive a god who'll move into you and put in place a work where he's going to sanctify you and set you apart for his purposes count the cost if you should be lost yes count the cost if you're going to trust christ i'll guarantee you The cost is a whole lot higher if you don't know Christ than if you do know Christ. If you're not saved this morning, give your heart to Christ. I'm going to ask the praise team. I think they're here. They're going to come and sing. If you're not saved this morning and you want to be, you want to even ask some questions about it, I'll be here at the front. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. You come and take my hand and say, Preacher, I need to be saved. There's some of you here this morning who might say, you know, I've been saved, but I've never been baptized. And you need to say, Pastor, I want to sign up for the next baptism membership class. We're going to have one right away. Christian, how are you in your relationship with God this morning? What are you anticipating from God as you're living today? What do you need to do? Get it right before you go out those doors, please.